If I could have your attention, we're going to begin. Welcome, thank you all for being here, and thank, thank you to those of, uh, of you joining us uh, by videotape or live, live streaming. Uh, this is the Federal Society's panel entitled Foreign Sovereigns and Innovation, Job Creation, and International Competition. I'm Dean Reuter, Vice President and General Counsel and Director of Practice Groups of the Federal Society. It falls to me to moderate today's panel, uh, and I'm very pleased to be here. This is a topic that is near and dear to my heart. I've spent some time studying it, so I'm looking forward uh, to the panelists' remarks. I'm gonna introduce each of them briefly, then we'll get opening remarks from each of about 10 minutes, uh, then maybe some back and forth between and among the panelists, but we'll ultimately be looking to you for your questions. We've got a couple floor mics. Please use those microphones so we catch your questions uh, on the videotape. Uh, we're gonna hear first from Maureen Olhausen. She was sworn in as a commissioner of the Federal Trade Commission in April 2012, and then designated to serve as acting chair by President Trump on January 2017. Now, prior to, prior to joining the commission, uh, she was a partner at the Wilkinson Barker Nauer Law Firm, uh, which figures prominently, frankly, in the Federal Society's telecommunications practice group, so I work with them uh, quite a bit. Uh, before that, she served on the commission uh, at the commission, I should say, uh, for 11 years in a variety of uh, senior staff positions. She also spent, I think interestingly, five years on the U.S. Court of Appeals, uh, serving as a law clerk for Judge David Sintel and as a staff attorney, and she also served in a similar capacity for the Court of Federal Claims. Uh, as I mentioned, she's gonna go first, but uh, let me introduce the other two panelists before I turn it over to her. Uh, we'll hear second from Alden Abbott. He's the Rumpel Senior Legal Fellow and Deputy Director of the Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies at the Heritage Foundation, where he has been since uh, early 2014. Before that, he was uh, a, a Director of Patent and Antitrust for the Blackberry Firm. Uh, and before that, he was in a variety of senior government positions, including uh, an impressive list, I think, antitrust policy for the Federal Trade Commission, acting general counsel of the Commerce Department, chief counsel for the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, and a senior counsel in the Department of Justice. Uh, finally, we will hear from Seth Bloom. He's president and founder of Bloom Strategic Council. Uh, he's one of the leading Washington attorneys in large and complex mergers. Uh, he's the former longtime general counsel of the U.S. Senate Antitrust Subcommittee. His clients now include Comcast, Amazon, Aetna, Miller Coors, Microsoft, Sprint, Massimo, Yelp, and on and on. So you get the sense that uh, uh, he, he's doing some important work. Uh, <laughs> um, Prior to his Senate service, he, he also spent three years as a trial attorney in, in the Justice Department's antitrust uh, division. I mention that because I think it's important for today's discussion. So we've got a wealth of experience here on our panel. Uh, I will uh, subside and turn it over to Chairman, uh, Acting Chairman Olhausen. Well, th thank you, Dean, uh, for that nice introduction. I'm delighted to join the Federalist Society today to talk about foreign sovereigns and innovation, job creation, and international competition. In recent years, several foreign governments have brought high-profile cases against large, well-known American companies for monopolization or abuse of dominance. Not all of these cases have been about intellectual property, but all involved industry-leading companies who had reaped substantial rewards for the innovations they brought to market. That U.S. companies appear to be uniquely investigated for such violations and subject to sometimes eye-poppingly large fines raises concerns that some foreign enforcers may be using their competition laws for protectionist reasons. Compounding this problem, in some instances, the defendants have complained about a lack of due process or a fair chance to contest the foreign competition agency's allegations. And the question for us today is, even if the objectives are not improperly protectionist, do these actions by foreign governments harm incentives for innovations, both in these countries and in the United States? And first, I want to talk a little bit about IP and innovation. As we all know, innovation drives the development of new and improved products and services. But innovation isn't easy. It involves a winding road from idea to invention, through development to commercialization. And each of these steps can be risky and 
expensive, and unpredictable. Now, America's founders understood the importance of protecting property, including intellectual property. And the Constitution wisely provides that Congress shall have power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writing and discoveries. And the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit has observed that if one were to remove the right to exclude from the basket of rights attached to patents, the express purpose of the Constitution and Congress to promote the useful arts would be seriously undermined. And the Supreme Court has also recognized the important role of IP protection. And the facts bear out this connection. In the United States alone, the government recently reported that IP intensive industries support at least 45 million US jobs and contribute more than 6 trillion or 38% of US gross domestic product. Now, empirical research also supports the fundamental role that patent rights play in promoting innovation. And I've written at length, most recently in the Harvard Journal of Law and Technology, about the positive correlation between robust IP rights and R&D investment in developed countries. So here's just a small example of the research that I looked at. So scholars who examined data from 60 countries between 1960 and 1990 to explore the relationship between IP rights and economic growth found that intellectual property rights affect economic growth by stimulating the accumulation of factor inputs like research and development capital and physical capital. Now, while I could go on and on about the research, I think the point is clear. There is a clear connection between the strength of patent protection and increases in innovation and economic activity. Now, despite this clear connection, we've seen other countries take approaches that potentially limit the value of IP through antitrust policies, rules, or enforcement actions that go to the very core of a patent holder's right to exclude. For example, several countries have an essential facilities doctrine that they would apply to intellectual property. Now, the U.S. Supreme Court has questioned the foundation for this doctrine in the Trinco decision. Yet enforcement guidelines in other countries would obligate patent holders to license patents that are determined to be essential, as in China, for competitors to compete in the same market, or practically impossible, as in Korea, for them to compete without access to the patented technology. Now, of course, technologies that are most likely to be considered essential are probably the most valuable ones, providing the greatest reward to the owner for its invention. When the essential facilities doctrine is applied to IP rights, it fundamentally undoes what the patent laws are intended to do. Rather than reward innovators for the successful efforts and ingenuity with a temporary patent monopoly, antitrust enforcement would take away those rewards. And I think this is the wrong choice for countries that want to promote innovation and the economic benefits that come from it, as does the United States. Now, I'll talk a little bit about remedies. Now, ultimately, every sovereign nation gets to decide for itself how much it cares about innovation and whether it wants to create a legal structure that fosters or undermines the incentives to create new and useful products. Where these choices can cause problems is when those different objectives come into direct conflict with the policy choices we've made in the United States to promote innovation. In this respect, remedies in foreign antitrust cases that go well beyond what is necessary to address the harm, in that, uh, that the harm to that country's consumers have a dangerous potential to undermine policy choices in the United States. Now, the recent international guidelines that the FTC and Department of Justice issued just earlier this year, in them we made clear that we limit U.S. antitrust laws to harm or threatened harm to U.S. commerce and consumers. In particular, the guidelines explain that in making investigative and enforcement decisions, the agencies focus on whether there is a sufficient connection between the anti-competitive conduct and the United States, such that the federal laws apply and the agency's enforcement would redress harm or threatened harm to U.S. commerce and consumers. <coughs> 
And similarly, the guidelines identify important limits on the agency's pursuit of extraterritorial remedies and explicitly provide that the agencies will seek a remedy that includes conduct or assets outside the United States only to the extent that including them is needed to effectively redress harm or threatened harm to U.S. commerce and consumers and is consistent with the agency's international comedy analysis. And this statement reflects the appropriate approach to remedies involving both merger divestitures and conduct remedies that the Commission, in my opinion, and all competition agencies should follow. In today's interdependent world, the guidelines provision on extraterritorial remedies limits overly broad extraterritorial reach while recognizing and allowing for effective enforcement. And such an approach helps avoid potential duplication and conflicting remedies, including through the recognition of comity. And the guidelines provide a statement of self-restraint and offer an approach worthy of consideration by other jurisdictions. Finally, I'd like to address another aspect of some of these notable decisions, and that's the size and the basis for the fines imposed. So DG Comp in Europe fined Google more than $3 billion earlier this year, and it had it fined Intel $1.3 billion in a ruling that was recently reversed. And Qualcomm was subject to a $1 billion fine in China in 2015, and similarly large fines were imposed on it in Korea and Taiwan in the past year. And in each case, the fine was for abuse of dominance or monopolization. Now, in the United States, by comparison, we seek fines only for criminal violations of antitrust laws, which have been limited to hardcore cartel violations involving secret agreements on price or output, bid rigging, and allocation of markets. Now, not only are these global fines appearing in abuse of dominance cases, they are often based on two troubling principles. First, these fines are typically based on a company's turnover, sometimes global turnover, rather than on some connection to the economic harm that results from the anti-competitive conduct within the jurisdiction imposing the fine. Now, of course, in the United States, damages in private litigation are determined based on actual harm. Second, the, har the fines are calibrated to a percentage of turnover that may vary but oddly, in some instances, been towards the higher end of the allowable range, usually 1 to 10 percent. So, for example, NDRCs, that's the Chinese enforcement agencies, uh, fine of Qualcomm was 8 percent of relevant turnover. By comparison, in a recent cartel case against PVC manufacturers in China, NDRC impose, imposed fines of 1 to 2 percent of turnover against the numerous defendants. And more generally, NDRC proposed draft rules on fines, uh, proposed them in 2016, that set a baseline fine of 3% for turnover for both cartel <coughs> conduct and abuse of dominance, subject to adjustment for various factors. Now, while such guidance promotes transparency, in my view, equating cartels and abuse of dominance in terms of level of fine is not sound policy. We know that cartel conduct is almost always conducted in secret, whereas dominant firm conduct is typically known to at least competitors and customers, if not to the entire public. In other words, detection of conduct that may constitute monopolization is typically not a problem, and thus there's little rationale for stiffening fines due to the challenge of effective detection. Even then, cartel conduct is uniformly harmful. It presents no cognizable consumer benefits. And by comparison, monopolization, even when deemed a violation, likely comes with at least some pro-competitive benefits, just ones that don't justify the conduct. And finally, monopolization cases are among the toughest to assess. And while I think we in the U.S. generally get it right, and I've made it clear when I think we haven't, there is less certainty that we are getting it right than with a cartel case. So while I urge caution with, in remedies generally, I believe particular caution with respect to fines is appropriate in monopolization cases. Specifically, such fines should at least be limited in regard to their percentage of turnover, and the turnover at issue should be limited to the affected markets, both product and geographic, that are at issue. 
And this is necessary to calibrate the fines more closely to the possible harm the conduct may be causing. And also more careful consideration of fines in such cases will avoid deterring what is often the conduct that we want to promote, bringing it back to the beginning of my remarks, which is aggressive competition, innovation, and efficiency enhancing activity. So thank you for your attention and I look forward to the discussion. Uh, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank the Federalist Society, in particular Julie Nix, Dean Reuter, for organizing this excellent program and all their hard administrative work. Uh, although, of course, I am with the Heritage Foundation, the remarks I express today represent my point of view, not necessarily the view of any of my heritage colleagues. Now, let, let's, uh, Maureen uh, has already alluded to the issues surrounding extraterritoriality and concerns about, about it. Now, to put this in perspective, uh, the so-called so effects doctrine, which was referred to where the U.S. will exercise jurisdiction uh, and now under the current law over conduct that has a direct, substantial, and reasonably foreseeable effect on U.S. commerce, that was most enunciated by the uh, DC by uh, Second Circuit and really was treated as a Supreme Court opinion uh, by uh, Judge uh, Learned Hand in his 1945 Alcoa opinion. At that time, ironically, the US for a number of decades was the outlier. Uh, certainly European states uh, who were beginning to be active in antitrust, some other states uh, adhered to the territorial principle of for exercise of jurisdiction and you know as uh, and they claimed that uh, it was in inconsistent with principles of public international law and certainly comedy if not that to exercise jurisdiction over conduct taking place abroad that affected US consumers or business and indeed in 19 as late as the 1980s when I was uh, a member in the Justice Department of the British government and French government, other governments fought hard with passed special statutes to try and reverse the effects of, of attempts to go after cartel conduct taking a place overseas that, that harmed U.S. consumers. Uh, so there was actually a period when the U.S. was far more eager to apply its laws overseas uh, in that sense than uh, uh, other major jurisdictions. Now today, all major jurisdictions adhere to some form of the uh, uh, this effects doctrine. They use different terms, but uh, certainly Europe's European recognition of this dates back to a, a case called Woodpulp, which is about 25 years old. But anyway, so that everyone accepts uh, extraterritoriality to some extent. But and here's the big but in which. Uh, Acting Chairman Olhausen uh, emphasized the U.S. and in particular the FTC has been very careful that when their orders have some sort of extraterritorial effect that they are calibrated carefully to avoid uh, taking action that is not necessary to remedy harm, actual harm uh, to, to U.S. consumers and I think a couple of uh, examples one might cite. Uh, uh, in Google, in Polypore, a merger case in 2010, a consummated merger uh, handled by the FTC, the 11th Circuit confirmed the FTC's reason for requiring the divestiture of an Austrian plant, factory, because the divestiture was required by the buyer of divested assets to compete effectively in North America. So here's an overseas divestiture, but directly tied to, to effects in the US. And in Google MMI, a 2013 settlement uh, from which uh, Acting Chairman Olhausen dissented on other grounds, basically that this was not really appropriate for the application of antitrust law, there was a restriction on patent licensing terms only affected arrangements with willing licensees who are subject to the jurisdiction of U.S. district courts. So although uh, the uh, consent 
uh, had so seemed to be global on its face, this limitation cabined its application only to, only to the aspects of global conduct, patent licensing, needed to effectively redress harm or threaten harm to U.S. Co commerce and consumers. And I know Commissioner Olhausen, uh, or Acting Chairman Olhausen, has, has spoken to this eloquently uh, in, I think, a speech in Fiesole a couple of months ago. So wh what are other countries doing now? Well, uh, it's, it's, it's really a mixed bag. And interestingly enough, I think the, the, Euro the European Commission has been quite careful, in my view, not to try to, one couldn't disagree, as I do, on substantive matters with some of their single firm conduct cases. But as to extraterritoriality, they've de developed, a, adopted a cautious traditional approach, consistent with principles of international comedy and sovereignty that regulates only domestic conduct related to domestic patents. And that was the case in the investigation into the US of uh, standard essential patents by uh, Motorola Mobility and Samsung, where the uh, commission refrained, European Commission, from pursuing any regulatory measures outside a European uh, sovereign territory. Now, now, I mentioned this issue of standard essential patents for those of you not, not uh, familiar with the lingo, these are patents which so-called read on technical standards that are widely used in industry, normally developed by a standard-setting body. So, uh, so companies come together in a standard-setting body. They say, okay, this is the best technology that everyone can use as for basic chip, say semiconductor chip, we can compete on other aspects of equipment or additions to the chip, but we're going to agree on this basic aspect. And if you have a patent that covers some portion or all of that basic aspect of a chip, uh, somebody is going to, at least as a legal matter, need a license to be able to make products based on a chip. That's called a standard essential patent. Now, there's been, for over a decade, probably a 1,001 law review articles and commentaries about about uh, the issue and development of standard essential patents in standard setting bodies and whether, uh, what rules standard setting bodies should have so that the patent holder can't sneakily hide its patents and after, after the, having engaged in a standard body demand higher royalties that are available because of the extra monopoly power uh, bestowed by, by standard setting. But anyway, so this is a big hot issue and and uh, attacks on licensing practices, not just of SEPs, by, but other patents of major US firms have been occurring around, around the world. Uh, so uh, again, another issue, again, beyond the scope here, and, and I think, again, uh, Acting Chairman Olhausen has written that, that, gee, just trying to go after licensing because the complaints often are that the licensing terms are too onerous unilateral licensing or overly high royalty are being asked. It's really a matter best handled by contract law, tort law, perhaps patent law, and I trust, certainly as the US Supreme Court precedent views it, shouldn't really fit well. But other countries uh, really have not followed that, so we have to deal with them. Now, again, looking at those countries, as I said, the Europeans have been fairly good. Uh, not so, no, not so Korea. I mean, it, recently, uh, and it's a few months ago, in its Qualcomm decision, um, the KFTC purported, in addition to imposing a huge fine on Qualcomm, said basically, you have, if you have uh, SEP licensing terms, uh, and somebody who thinks that the terms are overly high or onerous, they can come to you, and you have to negotiate on good faith to, to change those terms. Uh, what does that mean? Well, that, that might mean there's no limit, territorial limitation in that order. Now, that, uh, Qualcomm has appealed that. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens, but that, that is the real concern, that if countries uh, don't want to single out the Korean KFTC, but if there are other jurisdictions that have, if they fought, were to follow that lead, I think China, the uh, the question about uh, extraterritoriality is, is, is jury is out, same with Taiwan. 
but that would be a real concern because that would be a real, a real problem if, by, because by its nature, you'd probably de be dealing with a lot of licensing, lot of licenses which have no real effect, okay, inside the country. That's, pro that's uh, a real, real problem as a matter of comedy and international law and hopefully can get, uh, should get straightened out, but that's some, there's reason for concern about that. Now, I think, but, uh, but uh, I think Chairman Olhausen uh, uh, alluded to the real elephant in the room, the real, really big problem, which is the weakening of patent rights. Now, part, there, another issue associated with that has been that the U.S. Uh, it is, uh, is less friendly to, in some respects to patent holders trying to maintain their rights in Germany or China, say. Might surprise some people. Why? Because up until a decade ago, until a um, uh, decision called eBay, the Supreme Court said there's a presumption that you have a right as a patent holder to get an injunction for an infringement of your patents. Now there's an equitable balance that courts are told to, to look at, and that might be correct with given statutory language, but traditionally, patent right is a property right. If you believe it's a pop property right, it's a right to exclude. And if you cannot exclude uh, by getting injunction, you lose a lot of bargaining power, uh, and particularly given the tendency of courts to say that the, the most you can get is reasonable royalties. So there is a real danger that firms are gonna say, well, we can't be enjoined. Let's start uh, not worrying about whether or not our particular products we're making, say our our, our com, uh, com computers are violating patents or not because even if eventually we, we get hit with patent infringement, so what? We pay reasonable royalties. Uh, meanwhile, you know, uh, we're in great shape. And we don't really have to negotiate that hard because nobody who, who says what reasonable terms are, uh, it's very unlikely a judge is going to issue an injunction. So th that, in my mind, is a very big problem. Another issue is that the Supreme Court has narrowed the scope of, of patentable subject matter uh, through a number of decisions. And also Congress in 2011 enacted the change to the patent law, establishing an administrative tribunal that uh, has allowed patents already issued, in which by statute now are property rights. You get a new uh, administrative tribunal looking at these patents. Uh, and uh, 70 to 90 percent of patent claims, individual claims within patents, have been knocked out by this administrative tribunal, which did not exist until this 2011 legislation. Now, there's some critics of patents say, well, there's some bad patents out there. Uh, maybe you're just getting rid of the, of, of the chaff. But there's a lot of evidence to the contrary, and there's a lot of evidence that there's some major innovations which were, whose patentability was upheld in federal court. And by the way, this tribunal makes, has a different standard than federal court standard for evaluating uh, the patents. Well, uh, patentability, it's made it much easier to, to strike these down. And, uh, and in fact, this whole issue about patents is gonna come up once again to the Supreme Court in a case called uh, Oil States, which will be argued November 27th. And there, uh, the question the court is looking at is, uh, does this uh, tribunal, the so-called Patent Trials and Appeal Board, violate the Constitution, the right to trial by jury for cases, which were cases that common law in the 18th century? Now, that might be, seem abstract, but a real concern here is that uh, here in Federalist Society members believe that you know, it's the role of the, uh, the judiciary to say what the law is. See Marbury versus Madison. If you believe that's good law, allowing a property right to be stripped and destroyed by, by, uh, an, ex by an executive branch functionary, not even presidential appointee, under standards that would not be accepted in federal court is very disturbing. Uh, I, I, for one, think it's, it's unfortunately unlikely that the court will strike down the constitution to, uh, constitutionality of what these boards are doing in their patent reviews. But this is a major issue, which suggests to me that legislative reform may be needed. Apart from legislative reform, hard to do, what could be done? Well, I think the U.S. needs to be, have a very proactive approach uh, 
Uh, I think, uh, as alluded to, I think U.S. antitrust agencies dropped the ball and made some very negative pronouncements in last administration, partic particularly last two years, about, about patent rights, which may have encouraged, encouraged an anti-patent uh, reaction overseas. So I think it's very important that, uh, that the U.S. Uh, new leadership in the antitrust agencies be very aggressive in trying to restore what I thought was a bipartisan understanding regarding uh, patent principles. Also, the administration may want an interagency working group, which in a Reagan administration, there was an interagency working group with the patent office, the antitrust division, worked very hard to, to uh, develop stronger respect for patent rights uh, with, within government. Uh, those are just a couple of things, and uh, probably overstate my welcome as it is, but I look forward to your uh, thoughts and questions. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Dean and the Federal Society, for your invitation to speak today. I should say, because, Dean, you were kind enough to list some of my clients, that I am speaking today on my own personal behalf. My views don't not necessarily reflect any of my clients. Um, I think we've had a very interesting uh, discussion so far uh, about the issues. I might take a slightly different tack, but I, I, I want before I get into that, I want to talk about what we share in common. Uh, I think we all share in common the view that antitrust, as applied by foreign governments, should not be used as a protectionist tool to protect their national companies are national champions. That's very wrong. And I think we also strongly agree that patent rights should be respected and they're essential for innovation. Uh, and as, as uh, the acting chairman said, they're written into our constitution. And I think that's very important. So as I say, I'm going to take somewhat of a different tack, but I, I, maybe I'll try to give myself some credibility before I start dissenting. Uh, in, in, in March of 2016, I published a, an article in the uh, uh, in the, um, I can't remember the name of the journal, but the, uh, <laughs> the Global Competition Review, uh, the misuse of competition policy threatens legitimate patent rights. So I very much of the view that we ought to be on guard about that. And we particularly saw at that time in Asia efforts to, it, 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 to uh, sort of uh, what appeared to be expropriate patents from, from American companies in a way that uh, to, to protect national champions. I'll just, one example was a proposal in China uh, which stated that the implementation of patent rights shall abide by the good faith principle, shall not harm public interests, shall not improperly exclude or restrict competition, and shall not impede the advancement of technology. And what, what they meant by the good faith principle and what type of activity would be sufficient to harm public interests is never defined. That was a proposal in the summer of 2015. Uh, and, but, you know, there's been a lot of good work by the FTC, by the Justice Department's Antitrust Division to try to, uh, and by private industry, to try to sort of um, uh, persuade these governments not to pursue those kinds of, uh, those kinds of regulatory or legislative measures. So I guess this is all by way of introduction. Because th with the particular danger that these pieces of legislation, what I talked about in my article, were not about standard essential patents. I think when we talk about standard essential patents, that's something very different. Um, and, you know, as, as th these were just normal patents which the patent holder had a right to, uh, to exclude any, he could, could sell the patent at any rate that patent holder decided and exclude uh, companies from gaining the patent. That's what a patent's about, it's a 20 year exclusivity. But there's something special called a standard essential patent, which Alden talked about. And uh, the rules here are very different. And uh, I don't think we have the same concern with respect to enforcement of standard essential patents. Uh, now, standard essential patents are patents used in typically in dynamic and uh, competitive technology industries to create needed standards and allow different technologies and products to work together easily. The Federal Trade Commission in 2013, in testimony at the Senate Judiciary Committee, said that standard setting activity plays a valuable and pro-competitive role in protect, promoting innovation. SEPs, standard essential patents, SEPs are uh, developed by standard setting organizations in which, and this is the important point, which the owner of the SEP, in order for getting its technology incorporated into the patent, are required, required to license uh, 
the SEPs on fair, reasonable, and non-discriminatory terms, what people in the field called FRAN terms. Um, and technology is as old as the electronic plug and wall socket and as new as Wi-Fi internet connections and USB ports in, in mobile devices all rely on SAPs. And those are just a couple of examples. There are hundreds or maybe thousands of, of uh, technologies that rely on SAPs. Now, I believe, is unlike the other kinds of patents, SEPs are a legitimate subject for regulation and oversight by competition authorities. Uh, adoption of a standard necessarily confers market power on the SEP holder. Without an, ob without an obligation to license, an SEP owner can unilaterally prevent competitors from using its technology and the standard and, and thereby foreclose competition in downstream product markets. Um, Bill Baer, formerly the, the Assistant Attorney General for Antitrust in the Obama administration, said while he was AAG uh, in 2015, in recent years, quoting him, in recent years it has become well understood that the competitive process can suffer when the value of a patent is enhanced by becoming essential to a standard and patent holders seek to exploit that added value by failing to keep the commitments they voluntarily make about how they will license these patents. So as I say, I think SEPs are a very different standard of patents. And I, I'll, I'll add to that, uh, there was a hearing at the House uh, Antitrust Subcommittee in June about similar issues that we're discussing today. And I, I was struck by the uh, testimony of the App Association uh, which sort of, I think, reflects what I'm trying to say today. Uh, they First, they said it is critically important that antitrust authorities around the globe recognizing the contributions of U.S. business and refrain from using antitrust law for protectionist ends against them. We all can agree with that. And then they said, and then they talking, sort of turning it to, to the subject of standard essential patents, we are concerned that some companies have been the, that have been the target of antitrust enforcement might point to a pattern of alleged malfeasance by antitrust authorities overseas to shift the focus from their own anti-competitive behavior. Um, the, the subcommittee, therefore, should be careful not to condemn the good faith actions by foreign antitrust authorities, actions that rightly enjoin market activity that harms competition and consumers, particularly when these actions are aligned with the U.S. government's enforcement activities. Um, and here we're, we're talking about standard uh, uh, essential patent. And, and they go on to say, when a company has its patent included in a technical standard, that, pa that patent becomes a standard essential patent. An SEP owner voluntarily commits to license his patent on fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory FRAN terms to any willing licensee, including competitors. Uh, and so we saw, and, and, uh, and we've, we've heard reference to this already, but Alden talked about it uh, to some extent, the, the case that was brought against Qualcomm. And, uh, and this, I think, is sort of the elephant in the room here on this subject. You know, the, the, we heard about the Chinese levying a billion dollar fine. South Korea levied a fine of no, almost $900 million. And just uh, in early, uh, at the end of December last year, Taiwan fined um, Qualcomm $773 million earlier this month. And you could say, oh my God, whatever the merits of the size of the fine, but you could say, oh my God, what are these countries doing? They're going after a fine American company and aren't they doing this really to protect their uh, their own national champions. And I really disagree with that. Um, now it pains me also to disagree with the acting chairman because I hold her in very high regard. But I know, but I know, I know she dissented from the FTC's decision to file uh, a case against Qualcomm. And, uh, but uh, I mean, I think that the fact of that case and the fact of, uh, that we have also already a decision on that case, a denial of a motion to dismiss, which obviously assumes that all the allegations in the complaint are true. But if all the allegations in the complaint are true, and I think the, I hold the FTC in high regard that generally the allegations put in the FTC complaints are true, um, it, the, the case clearly stated an antitrust case under U.S. antitrust law, uh, under uh, Section 2 monopolization case, uh, Section 5 of the FTC Act. So just, I don't want to talk too much about that case, but I think just talking about a couple of points in that case illustrates why enforcement, antitrust enforcement, to, uh, against holders of standard essential patents who don't live up to their obligations is really crucial and is sound, you know, it's a sound exercise of antitrust authority to protect com competition, the competitive process, and to protect consumers. So what do we have in this case? We have Qualcomm, which has about an 80% market share, or at least an 80% market share in a type of what they call baseboard processor or modem chip, the chip that's used in the cell phones to, to uh, uh, use its essential in order to make complete calls. But interestingly enough, most of 
Qualcomm's market share is in an older technology, 2G or 3G technology. So, uh, but they have that. And any cell phone manufacturer, well, any cell phone uh, manufacturer needs that technology if they're gonna, if they're going to, uh, if they're gonna produce a cell phone. But importantly here, this was part of a standard. Qualcomm agreed to make that available to competitors and any, and all willing purchasers, license it on fair and reasonable and non-discriminatory terms. I think the, the thing here is fair and reasonable because we hear like how can these Asian countries insist on the, the terms uh, or, or say that a certain, a certain um, uh, licensing fee is excessive. Well, Qualcomm, in this case the standard essential patent holder, agreed on fair and reasonable, uh, to license on fair and reasonable terms. When you agree to do that, you essentially opened yourself up to say what's fair and what's reasonable. But did, but did they do that? As alleged by the FTC and, as, and by these competition authorities in Asia, they did not. They refused to license the technology to competing manufacturers of these processors or modem chips. Uh, in addition to that, they said to, to, um, to cell phone manufacturers, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna license our standard essential uh, patents but we're gonna charge you a 5% royalty over the price of the entire device, uh, rather than the value of the actual standard essential patent. And they've done that despite the fact that their technology is old technology and is, does, isn't used for applications like photo or video, certain types of data applications, things that smartphones are ubiquitously used for rather than the voice calls that these, this, this technology was, 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 was uh, used for uh, originally. In addition to that, the FTC has described what they call a no license, no chips policy, where they won't allow uh, cell phone manufacturers to get access to their modem chips unless they accept these licensing terms, which is very different from, from most companies in the industry, which will license the, the technology to somebody and then their, their patent rights are exhausted under the doctrine of patent exhaustion. And they even went to Apple. You think, who could bully Apple the size of Apple, but they said, it, you will ha you agree to exclusively carry our modem chips, and then, or you won't get what amounted to hundreds of billions of dollars in what they called rebates from the licensing terms for the period 2011 to 2016. Another exercise of of um, of market power. So, um, I mean, the conclusion of all of that, and the reason I went into that detail is I think you see in this case really an exercise of monopoly power conduct designed to maintain a monopoly, conduct that's gonna result in higher prices because of this 5% licensing, which ultimately get passed on to consumer of this vital devices, devices that all of us live with, you know, almost 24 seven, and, uh, and conduct that is preventing a nascent industry from emerging, that is competitors to Qualcomm and modem chips. I think this complaint by Asia, as well as by the FTC, but we're talking about Asian enforcement today, this complaint by these Asian governments was entirely in consistent with antitrust law as we understand it, and is not an exercise of uh, an effort to try to protect national champions. By the way, as to that point, you know, Apple is their <laughs> gigantic adversary here, and a, a very large American company has filed their own antitrust case against Qualcomm. So it's hard to say that this was an exercise by China or Taiwan, or you name it, to protect their local companies when, when uh, you know, Apple's one of the companies that's complaining most about it. So I guess I, I want to say um, that you ha one has to be careful in, uh, in, in considering this question of foreign nations so-called abusing antitrust law and in the, in the application of international property, of intellectual property rights. Um, and and uh, I think in this particular issue of standard essential patents, that's an area where I think is, there's well room for, for enforcement of antitrust law by Asian nations or any nation for that matter, including our own. And uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you one and all. Thank you uh, for your remarks. We've covered a lot of territory. I guess I should, should have started by saying uh, my statements don't necessarily reflect the views of the Federal Society. Uh, they might, even, might not even reflect my own views. But um, let's, let's start um, with a question or two. Um, we, we've talked, at least touched on uh, sort of the substantive parts of, of, of the case, uh, 
uh, some of these cases uh, coming out of, uh, of Asia, and, and due process has been mentioned. But, but So I want to focus more on the due process aspects, especially um, setting aside the substantive stuff, uh, when, when it comes to burdens of proof. And then the, the um, I think it was also mentioned, the, either the bilateral, multilateral trade agreements, how the process is used in these cases compared to uh, any relevant requirements of uh, international trade agreements. Well, let, let me jump in on the, the due process sure. issues to begin with. Uh, procedural uh, fairness is critical, and one of the things that uh, we've done at the FTC and our colleagues at the Department of Justice as well have engaged internationally on uh, making clear what are the elements of due process, what, what, what should uh, um, a competition agency afford to someone who, uh, to a company or an individual who's, who's accused of, uh, of violating uh, the laws. Uh, and while each nation might have a different system, I think we should strive for, for the same uh, goals. Um, so a clear statement of the facts in the law, uh, the legal basis for the investigation that uh, the company is being subject to, uh, an opportunity to respond to those facts, right? To, to say why, why, they, why they disagree, what's being overlooked, or why that's not accurate. Uh, and both by engaging the investigation team and the ultimate decision maker. I think that's, that's crucial. Uh, some of the other things that we take for granted here in the U.S., like protection of attorney-client privilege, that's not universally respected, and uh, we think that's a, a very important thing. Um, and I'm concerned that some jurisdictions uh, provide few, if any, of these important guarantees. Uh, and some may provide some of them, but not, but not all of them, and I, I think it's... Um, something we, we need to pay close attention to because ultimately uh, it's not just uh, the law and the economics uh, that we should be concerned about. We should also be concerned about the process by which these decisions are being made. And if it you know, is overlooking facts or the, the defendant doesn't even have any idea of what's the basis for the charges or an opportunity to present uh, their side, or challenge uh, some of the evidence that's been presented, I think that's highly problematic. So I'm interested in hearing from Seth Bloom on the, on the due process issues. Is there, is there agreement that, that the processes are different uh, in different countries? And if that's the case, what does that mean? Well, I mean, I guess in some countries the processes are different, but I completely associate myself with uh, Maureen's remarks. Uh, and uh, it's, it's a basic aspect of justice that uh, parties be afforded an opportunity heard, to uh, note the charges against them, to confront the witnesses against them. Uh, these due process, uh, you know, we're not talking about substantive uh, uh, issues here, which I think there's a legitimate base for, we haven't gotten into that yet, but yeah. uh, should, should U.S. antitrust law always be the standard? I mean, I think there's a legitimate basis for foreign nations to have different substantive standards, but, and you know, you could even, again, this is getting outside your question, you can even say the consumer welfare standard, should that be followed by all nations, or should they be able to have their own interpretation? That's a different matter. Right. But when it comes to process, uh, absolutely. By the way, I, I feel compelled, and, 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 and Maureen didn't say anything about this, but I know critics of the South Korean decision in the Qualcomm case have said, well, there was no procedural process for, for uh, Qualcomm. Uh, that's really not true. I mean, uh, South Korea has a statute that says every, each, each party, um, uh, well, my, I, rather than read the statute, every party has to have a notice of the charges, has an opportunity to prevent witnesses, an opportunity for cross-examination, and that, that all was done in that case. So I know we're not here to debate the Qualcomm case, but I just want to say that because I've heard that as, uh, as a criticism of Korea. But absolutely, um, yes, procedural due process is, is, is fundamentally important. Uh, Alden, you, you look yeah, like you're going to say let something. Me just, uh, I, I think everyone agrees procedural due process is, is important. I think there is a bit of a rule of law issue in that a number of jurisdictions, at least on the books, provide you know, the right to, uh, to, to be heard in the administrative process, to have the charges explained to them. Very frankly, and I'm not going to talk about any particular case, but in some jurisdictions, the complaint has been that, that those uh, rules or even the, the procedures have been ignored and have not been followed through. That yes, there's some very nice provisions, but it doesn't mean that they're really being applied and that there is uh, an inconsistency in application. 
And more broadly, as I say, the rule of law is you not only have to have specificity in the law, but you have to believe that it, it's going to be neutrally applied and dispassionately applied and that uh, due process will be uh, inevitably uh, afforded. And again, I don't want to get into any country specifics, but I've heard enough stories from parties who've told us horror stories, and if just some of them were true, they would belie the facial pr protections found in the laws. Well, you know, I completely agree with that, Alden, to the extent those stories are true, that should concern us all, no question. And, and are the process questions important enough that if, if those processes aren't allowed for, uh, if they're not part of the process, does that undermine any substantive findings that are made? Do we, do we have agreement on the panel about that? Well, bad process leads to unreliable outcomes. I mean, I think that's sure, <laughs> that's why we value, good, you know, having uh, sufficient due process. And does anybody want to speak to the the uh, the bilateral trade agreements or the multilateral trade agreements? Are those being followed, or are there allegations in in some of these cases that those are being disregarded, or does that matter? Well, there is, a, for instance, the Korea U.S. Free Trade Agreement. There is competition provision, but uh, I've, I've heard it said that that has not been very effective. Now, one can agree or disagree. Now, it may be that some have argued some of these competition clauses and chapters in bilateral uh, agreements need to be perhaps uh, in the future rewritten in a manner that ensures that some sort of venue or an outlet to complain about a lack of consistency, maybe even arbitration. I'm not sort of beyond our scope, but I think that's certainly something to look at as, you know, in, in, in the future is on the international plane, the U.S. may want to pay some attention and make sure that that process is protected in any uh, clauses found in free trade agreements. Um, one of the issues we, we started to talk about, I think we don't think we've fully explored it, is protectionism. And one thing I've heard about a lot of these cases, especially as they, uh, not, not so much in Europe, I suppose, but, uh, but more so the case in Asia, a lot of the companies uh, that are competitors of the American businesses are tightly intermingled with the, the foreign sovereigns. And there so, so there are some allegations that foreign sovereigns are using their, their, their competition laws to favor their own sort of homegrown businesses. Um, is, is there evidence of that? Is that the case? Is that just a supposition or a reflection of the way things are aligned over there? Um, e even if it's not deliberate, is that alignment of, of businesses and government problematic? Um, and, and if so, what do we do about that? Well, uh, unlike the U.S., where we don't have state-owned enterprises, uh, in a lot of these nations where we are, you know, some concerns are being raised, they have direct government ownership or heavy government um, investment in competitors to, uh, to some of the companies that are being subject to, to antitrust enforcement. But it's a little difficult to assess because antitrust cases are so fact specific. So maybe we should look at some broader patterns and see if there's anything that we can uh, discern from that. Um, so, you know, we've seen some outlier cases where there's no comparative case against a domestic company who's engaging in the same behavior. or things like a high percentage of fines uh, imposed on foreign companies versus domestic companies. So PAR reported that over 95% of fines issued by Chinese antitrust authorities were against foreign firms. Uh, but then, as already been mentioned, some uh, foreign uh, antitrust agencies, they have a different, they have a different law, obviously they have a different law, but they may include factors that we don't include in the U.S. So, for example, South Africa wants to promote full employment and opportunities for disadvantaged persons, and Chinese law promotes the healthy development of the socialist market economy. So I guess the question is, are some of these different factors also explaining uh, some of these uh, different outcomes that have raised concerns about protectionism? Yeah, and, and if I can just give my, give my, my, my views on that, I mean, I think uh, Marine's right to raise those two examples, uh, particularly when you talk about China. You know, China has a long history of being a, well, we'll start as a communist nation. And, uh, it still is. It's still, okay, <laughs> according, <laughs> you, go to, you go to Beijing or Shanghai and you wonder because there's so much private enterprise, but yes. Uh, and, um, uh, but there are many, many state-owned enterprises. And, and the officials in the state-owned enterprises, you know, frequently are, they go into government and there's a lot of interchange. And uh, one has to wonder you know, how are the Chinese 
going to, will they treat Estonia in her praises? And it would not surprise, you know, one if, if there's a, there's some sort of uh, preference for those companies. I mean, I'm just sort of speaking as a commentator observing it. I don't have any specific factual cases to talk about, but I think the statistic that Maureen gave is, 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 is telling and something's going on there. Uh, and uh, so I think it's a challenge for U.S. antitrust enforcers who want to bring about harmonization in, in, in talking, and must be, to, in talking to their colleagues in uh, China or, or mainly in China, because that's the, the country that we deal with that has these communist roots, uh, to, uh, to try to remove that kind of preference from the way they review cases. Both, you know, so people at the FTC and the DOJ really have a, their work cut out for them, I think, in this area. And just one quick thing, again, on, uh, on the rule of law, and I'll, I'll just make an observation. I won't say what one should read into it, but at least as of a year or two ago, I know the patent courts in China had a political officer well, was a, who was a political officer represented with the Communist Party right. who could consult with the judges. And again, one can, I'm not saying, well, I was making any comment on any particular matter, but it's something one should note. So then, uh, that next question, if, if we layer on top of all the dynamics we just talked about, the age of some of these antitrust reinforcement regimes, it's taken our country, with the rule of law pretty firmly established, I think, decades to develop its antitrust uh, enforcement regime and sort things out. I think, uh, you know, I've heard that 20 years ago or even less, there were just a handful of countries um, in the world that had antitrust enforcement regimes. Now there are 140 or so. Uh, so by definition, most of these are younger, and even if you... Uh, um, allow good faith on their part. You say they're doing their best, uh, they're, they're new at it. Is that important? Does that matter? I, th I think that's very important, and the question is what do you do about it? Uh, and one of the things we've tried to do uh, in the U.S., both on an agency level and in an academic and private level, is to engage with these regimes around, around the world. So the FTC has done a lot of uh, engagement with enforcers to try to bring them training and a little more economic sophistication and, and discussions about, about the rule of law. And there's uh, private organizations that, that do that as well. And I think that's very important because to the extent the differences we're seeing are based on a lack of um, experience and um, uh, obviously antitrust law and when you layer IP on top of it are pretty complex areas. If we can give uh, you know, them some guidance, some point them in the right direction for how they should uh, analyze these complex areas, I think that's uh, to, to everyone's benefit. Alden or Seth? Well, let me let me ask a question that Seth Bloom might ask then uh, of, of our other two panelists, um, not to put words in your mouth, but um, are standard essential pat patents different? Uh, the way he's described them, uh, well, essential is the key word, I suppose. The, the, the uh, standard setters get together. They tend to be controlled by the businesses that are, that are developing patents, uh, and they decide that this, is, this USB port is what we're going to put in every electronic device. It's sort of the standard. And then after that, whoever has that patent, uh, who might well have been at the table setting the standard, um, sits on a pot of gold. Um, is there a reason to treat standard essential patents differently than, um, than other patents? I don't think so. As a patent, right, is this patent, because it's standard essential, somehow worthy of less patent protection, I think, is, is questionable. And when you look at the IP guidelines that the FTC and the DOJ uh, adopted at the end of the Obama administration, but they're bipartisan because I voted for them, you did not put in a special you know, category of lesser rights for standard essential patents. And, and you're, let me take issue with your description of the standard setting organization. Standard setting organizations need to have both people putting IP into it and people implementing that IP, and it is a contractual arrangement. And if it is not you know, serving both sides of that uh, equation, that standard setting organization is not going to succeed. So the question is, in my view, what were the commitments that the uh, entity who put the IP into the standard made? Uh, and one of the questions was, does fair, reasonable, non-discriminatory mean that you agree you'll never seek an injunction against a willing licensee. That's been a, ba a big issue. But certain standard-setting organizations rejected that as a term. So the question is, do we somehow re-import that as an antitrust violation? 
But one of the other things is also the presumption that the patent holder got that market power simply by it participating in the standard. For a lot of technologies, that patent is the only way to achieve that outcome. And so if they already have all that market power, whether they're in the, the, pat, the uh, standard or not, I've questioned why, we would, why antitrust has an appropriate role here. It's a different case when we've had um, situations where there are competing technologies, there's a deception on the standard setting organization, the company gets the market power because it, it um, concealed the fact that it had IP uh, in this uh, part of the standard, and then they, their market power is when it's adopted by the standard setting uh, organization, and then they pop out and say, aha, you all owe us all, all this money. Their interaction with the standard setting organization is what gave them that additional market power, and it was done through a way that uh, I think removed uh, an otherwise market restraint on them. For a company that already has monopoly power, it's not getting any more monopoly power by it being put in a, in a standard. And that's one of the, the problems, I think, when we talk about standard essential patents, we kind of, some people kind of lose sight of what antitrust is really trying to do and what are sort of the fundamental analysis that we're trying to look at here. It's not just that someone does something that someone else doesn't like. That's not what antitrust is, is about. Uh, we're happy to take questions from the audience if people want to start lining up, but Alden, you were going to say something, I believe? No, no, no. I, I think oh. uh, Maureen is quite right. I'm sure Seth will have something to say, but one, just one more interesting thing. One needs to remember, as Maureen very astutely pointed out, you have both implementers and patent holders. Now, one thing, standard setting bodies, they, they meet regularly, they tweak standards, come out with new standards, it's a repeat game. And if one party uh, is viewed as trying to, you know, exploit the process or, or, or misrepresent, if not out, if you're not dealing with outright deception, uh, to, to, to favor itself, it can be a loser in, in future rounds. But more generally, a big risk of standard setting, indeed a classic antitrust risk, was this collusion, was of collusion. So if you can imagine, if you have a bunch of people who are implementers who say, we want to pay as little as possible for this, input, this patent license, we are going to collude. We are going to agree that, that we're going to, on a set of rules, that is going to uh, give minimal returns to the patent holder because we don't have key patents, just a handful of firms do. That certainly is as big a threat, uh, and, and uh, that should also be kept in mind. And if I can just respond, I certainly don't support collusion amongst the people who want to implement the patent in the way you describe Alden. And actually, in, in terms of what you said, Maureen, I, I don't think I'm too far apart. I mean, I think what really we have to focus on is the commitment of the uh, of the SCP holder. I guess we have a difference of opinion in, in, in the in the Qualcomm case, but uh, I mean, I find it compelling. They made a commitment to license it here on fair and fran terms, fair and reasonable terms. And I think, given their market power in in the in the um, modem chip. That, that also is an important factor. But yes, it's really, it should focus on the commitment. I don't think standard essential patents are worthy of any less uh, deference than other kinds of patents. It's just that we have a participant here who's agreed to license it on FRAN terms through this agency and, and made that promise to the standard setting organization. That's, that's why I think. And I think one of the challenges that we're seeing is, because we're talking about this internationally, is in other uh, regimes around the world, they're not looking at whether, necessarily whether the patent holder put it willingly into a standard and somehow gained additional leverage that way. They look at it as saying, boy, that's really important technology. We are going to pull that into the standard and then say, oh, if other people want to compete, they have to have access to it, and we have an unfair pricing prohibition, so it's got to be at a price that our industry finds uh, acceptable, right? So it's, it's we're using the same words in the U.S., but very different things. The essential facilities doctrine is not based on any kind of contractual agreement to license unfair, reasonable, non-discriminatory terms. It's the idea that this is such important technology, everyone has to have access to that's it. That's what China tried to do in 2015, as I talked about in my article. You, you're absolutely right. right. And that's, that's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> they, it's, they, it's very concerning. <laughs> right. yeah. Well, we, we've mentioned a couple times this, sort of the, the American regime uh, whether it's the FTC or, or elsewise, uh, for being a leader in the international community. Um, uh, maybe 
providing examples or providing license for foreign uh, uh, antitrust re enforcement regimes. And again, if you have a question in the audience, just stand up uh, and, and uh, you, we're gonna use the floor mics. But I wonder if, if folks wanna talk a little bit more about that. Um, you, you know, you mentioned we only enforce, I think Maureen, for, um, for criminals, when, when there are criminal sanctions. Um, but but here, I'm, I, I think all of the cases we're talking about don't involve criminal sanctions. So how much is uh, America a leader, a trendsetter, um, or sort of a bad example? <laughs> Anybody want to respond we, to we, that? We might be all of those things, <laughs> depending on <laughs> what the matter well, is. Well, so, so how, do we, how do we do better in the one aspect, or how do we do better in all those aspects? Um, Alden, do you have thoughts on that? Well, as I, as I think I already mentioned, I think... Uh, Ironically, we are less, uh, a patent holder has a weaker right to obtain an injunction, certainly an SCP holder, than in Europe right now. The European Court of Justice in the Huawei v. ZTE case uh, said that recognized SCP holders' right to seek an injunction except in exceptional circumstances, and said delaying tactics by either side in negotiation are, unexpect are unacceptable, and also put a burden on an alleged infringer to diligently respond to an SCP holder's offer in accordance with recognized commercial practices in good faith. So, so in Germany, it's much easier to get an injunction on, on a, for patent infringement than in the US. So totally apart from antitrust, I think you have to see that as part of a bigger commercial context, how strong are patent rights? It used to be a decade ago or uh, certainly 20 years ago, the U.S. was a gold standard. Uh, everyone agreed, uh, and that attracts investment capital. Today, we're ranked number 10 in the world in, in the amount of protection we provide for patents, according to a major survey, and that is not a good po uh, position to be in. One hears of some uh, capital flowing to, for some projects to China or even Germany because of that. So I, I would just <laughs> mention a bigger context as well. Let's take a question from this side, if we could. Yeah. Hi, Bill Wichterman of Covington. Thank you very much for your comments today. Uh, regarding the question of, uh, L, of uh, SEPs, I think what uh, Chairwoman uh, Olhausen said about that if you're, you have a patent instead of SEP, it doesn't mean, therefore, you give up patent rights. It means you're committing to a friend, but it doesn't mean that you give up any rights. And I think what's happened in the last, I think it's two years since IEEE changed their policy vis-a-vis SEPs, we've seen a decrease in the number of LOAs, letters of assurance, which have been issued, which I think should be of concern to us. For innovation, SSOs are kind of an unheralded success story. I mean, most of the public has no idea that SSOs exist, and they don't need to, but it works. It's the private sector working so well, as, as Richard Epstein and Scott O'Keefe and Scott Keefe and others said in a paper a few years ago, and I think that we are facing a danger. If this spreads, and I know the Obama administration DOJ had, had put forward a positive business review letter about the IEEE policy. This spreads, this contagion. You'll see fewer companies willing to participate in these standards bodies, which I think will be inimical to progress and innovation. But I'd love your, the panel's thoughts on that for anybody. Well, um, I think one of the, the issues around the world, uh, as I've talked to uh, enforcers, is to make sure they are focused on dynamic effects rather than just the static effects. I, I think your question sort of anticipated some of the dynamic effects, right? So down the road, are people going to be inventing these new technologies or putting them into standards? P perhaps perhaps they won't because there, I think there is this um, uh, temptation to say, we want more competitors in the market and we're going to do that by sharing, making people share their IP without an appreciation of the fact that this is not static, that people will make investment decisions and commitment decisions based on uh, you know, that change in, in the policy. Oh, oh, I think that that's right. The dy uh, dynamic effects, certainly uh, innovation is, is key. And there's lots of research on the, the role of strong patent systems in, in, in promoting inno innovation and certainly the role of innovation, you know, dynamic efficiency compared to static efficiency. Robert Solo, Solo other major economists have certainly written about this, and, and that needs to be kept in mind. 
question only. Thank you very much. I've done very much. I'm involved with UNESCO since 2000, and I have the following question, very concrete one. Uh, we are involved with the Library of Congress, the World Digital Library Project, which has been asked through my services by the Chinese to uh, use the uh, preferably digital content from various countries around the world from the Library of Congress, World Digital Library, in order to help Silk Road, new Silk Road countries start a strategy in what is called cultural heritage, digital education, and so on. So this is a very specific request. Uh, we are in advanced stage. Uh, they are convinced that the United States, uh, with Smithsonian and the Library of Congress, can provide such an enabler. Now, how shall we price the services and the competence provided by the Library of Congress and Smithsonian given that it will be applied, what is expected to be applied in over 50 countries along the Silk Road, as well as in several regions in China, which are competing with each other uh, to be the first one to launch this process. So it's just one month's old evaluation. What are the criteria? How, how shall I price this? Anybody? Yes. I don't know that I have the expertise to answer that question, frankly, so uh, I think I will decline. Yeah, I, I don't have the details. Obviously, you know, the, there's, there's a great public good aspects to digitalization. There's some copyright issues that have arisen that's sort of beyond the scope of our topic, but Library of Congress bestows enormous public good benefits, you know, non-rivalness and consumption, non-excludability, uh, and certainly, uh, but in terms, I'm sorry, but without having more information, I would, would not really be able to comment intelligently. Let, let's move back just for a second uh, um, to, to the antitrust enforcement regimes of foreign countries and talk about the extraterritorial extra effect, if we could. We, we've touched on that, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in hearing from other panelists um, about U.S. extraterritorial effect versus foreign extraterritorial effect. How are those lines drawn? Are, are they, um, a, as, as stated, is it, is it as clear as, as I think it might be? Or? Seth, you want to respond first? Okay. Well, I mean, I, it, it's, it, there's sort of both an easy answer and then I don't, I don't know that it answers it. You've got 12 minutes, so you can give us the long answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, but the easy answer is it has to be a reasonable, foreseeable, and direct effect on the United States for the U.S. antitrust jurisdiction, U.S. antitrust authorities to have the ability to, to take these things on. But I think the, the complicated thing is what exactly does that mean? Well, are, are other are other countries trying to stay within that those lanes or or not? Well, is that your sense? Or? I mean, certainly the criticism of other countries is that they're not. Yeah. It's, it's, but I think it's really a case by case analysis uh, of how uh, the issues that are going on affect uh, their market uh, as well as foreign markets. Um. How many cases does it take for, for before you can say one country is sort of a bad actor in this regime? I find the whole thing daunting because, uh, you know, you've, you've antitrust regimes by state a U.S. state AGs, then the FTC, the DOJ, yeah. the FCC, right. and now you've got e, the EU and, and the Asian so, countries. And so, but, but can I make another comment? Yeah, um, please. Sort of, maybe a little bit in def in defense of, of foreign nations. I mean, we are we have a long history. Of, of going after conduct in the United States that go, that's occurring overseas. So, uh, you know, all these, these cartels, there, there was a movie made about the, the Lysine cartel, which was an American company in Japanese countries, the informant. Now, obviously, that was because it affected the U.S. market. Mm -hmm. That's the, we went after it. But there was freight forwarding overseas and air freight, which, which led to hundreds of millions of dollars in, in fines. Um, I guess I think we have to be a little cautious about saying these countries are behaving, you know, why are they going after this conduct? When we ourselves, you know, those who live in grass houses shouldn't throw stones. Yeah. Um, I guess that's my perspective on it. Right, okay, oh, fair I'll enough. I'll just mention the U.S. statute, the Foreign Trade Antitrust Improvements Act is one of the most confusing and badly written statutes, and there's still arguments <laughs> about, about the reach of some activity, foreign activity over, overseas with secondary uh, uh, effects here, it's a real mess. But I should say on a positive note, and I'm, and uh, Maureen can speak more directly to it, there's been a great growth in cooperation on cartel investigations, on, on other investigations, 
among uh, the major antitrust jurisdictions. There are regular discussions. There, there are issues sometimes of, of, of waiver, but those discussions have happened through, through bilateral and plurilateral agreements. They've happened through consultations that have occurred through the International Competition Network. So I think one, one needs to, in, in context, recognize that certainly in the cartel area, but some other areas, certainly mergers, other areas as well, there's a huge, huge amount of cooperation among the antitrust enforcers. And to, to end on a positive note, there are, uh, I, uh, Maureen, I don't know if. I uh, know, I think there is a huge amount of uh, dialogue and, and, and discussion, and I think, I think it's very valuable. But as for the extraterritorial issue, uh, it's not occurring just in abuse of dominance cases. There's also been some questions raised in merger cases about you know, the, a, a remedy that seems to require divestiture or, or, or commitments uh, that is unrelated to the merger that the, uh, or effects, likely effects of the merger that that entity was reviewing. So if we, we start to put it together into you know, mergers and conduct, and, and if, there, if the question isn't even being asked, to say, well, what is, how do we trace this back to the effect on commerce and consumers in the jurisdiction that is putting this remedy into place? Uh, rather, you know, that, that's problematic. We shouldn't be saying, well, you know, we're going to set the standard for the whole world, even if there isn't an effect yeah. in the U.S. And, and the cartel enforcement, uh, you know, we do, uh, there has been this big growth uh, in, in cartel enforcement, but for the U.S., it's tied, it has to be tied back to an effect uh, within, within the U.S. So yeah, and then important. there's a question about over-enforcement, you know, over-application of remedies, and there's a whole debate going on about that. But just on the mergers, just to add one point, I think there is a concern that some of the newer jurisdictions, which may have tenuous or no connections sure. to mergers, where there's no real showing in fact, still... Uh, require no merger notifications. It's a way of getting foreign uh, currency, to, uh, hard currency, frankly, in, uh, and in some jurisdictions. Uh, so, that, so that is a concern that certainly, I know multinational businesses <laughs> view some of that as just an, an additional cost of doing business. That's yeah. a fair point, Alden, I agree. Other questions from the audience? I'll ask a final question on mergers and acquisitions then, since we, and, we'll, and we'll end up here, I suppose. And, and that's, um, uh, you know, there are, there are two things I think that a government body can do during a merger and acquisition. They could just say, well, three things, I guess. They could say yes, absolutely. They could say no, absolutely. Or they could do something in between, which amounts to extracting concessions. Um, and I, I don't think the public's very much aware of that, that middle ground, um, that a merger might go through with approval, but you might have to spin off, you know, 400 Rite Aids or something like that. Um, For example. For example, <laughs> exactly. um, yeah, yeah, hypothetical. Um, what uh, what's happening at the international level w with those sorts of issues? Are we seeing? Uh, it seems daunting to me. Again, if I'm if I'm proposing a merger, I get through this regime, this regime, this regime, and then 140 cop uh, countries each get a, a bite at the apple. Is is that the approach, or is it not that bad, or what's happening? Well, for certain mergers. Uh, where there has been, um, you know, an effect in a, a variety of jurisdictions around the world, there has actually been a pretty good um, regime, or I don't know what you call it, um, you know, system in place mm -hmm. where you would have a, a remedy, say, for example, I've seen my time at the FTC, where there's been uh, an impact in Europe and an impact in the U.S., uh, and, or, you know, say, the, the Canada and the U.S., where the remedy that the foreign uh, regime is imposing takes care of the competitive concern in the U.S. Mm -hmm. So we've, we've had you know, one, ones like that. Um, or the, the question of um, you know, are there uh, you know, sufficient effects and are the remedies similar? So one of the, uh, the big uh, sort of uh, questions was raised about some of these hold separate agreements that China, they, they allow a merger to go through, but then you say you have to hold the assets separate and you have to, um, you have to operate them separately. I mean, so, you know, we basically say, except for the rare case where we have some behavioral remedy in a, in a vertical merger, say, okay, uh, you have to, this, these are the overlapping assets and you have to sell them off and you sell them off to a third party who will re at least replace the competition that was previously 
in the market, but we don't s say, well, you're going to, we're gonna allow you to merge, but you have to keep those two units separate and they have to operate separately and you, we're going to sort of oversee how, I mean, it's- Sounds it's, like an unmerger merger. Yeah, exactly, yeah. that's, a, that's yeah. a good way to put it. So that's <laughs> one of the areas where we see some of the merger remedies, uh, you know, raise, raise some questions. But uh, there have been a number of instances during my tenure that I've seen where uh, it's worked pretty well, right? So the remedies might, are, are not conflicting and often kind of take care of problems uh, across uh, jurisdictions. So, so one concern I might identify is, you know, in the United States, both the FTC and DOJ cannot seek a merger remedy unless they believe there's an injury to com substantial injury to competition. They just can't. They're not a regulatory agency. They can't. They can't just go out and say we'd like to see 40 Rite Aid stores divested. They have to show that there's an injury to competition in those markets that the only divestiture would solve. Uh, but I don't know if that's the case in, in in foreign jurisdictions, and particularly in these new and and, and, and nascent foreign jurisdictions, or, mm -hmm. or in you know a country like China, which just emerged from a or maybe still is in a communist regime, which highly <laughs> state. I, I think President Xi would say there's Okay, still that's true. <laughs> and it's never going to change either, according to him, right? So uh, it's written into the Constitution. Yes. So, right. Um, so I think, you know, I don't think they have that standard. I think they, they believe that we're the agency and we can order whatever remedies we want. And I think that's got to be a concern to, uh, you know, uh, multinational companies who are thinking about mergers uh, in these foreign jurisdictions. You know, we have Bayer Monsanto, for example right now being considered by the Justice Department with many foreign implications. And you know, I wonder what kind of demands are being made on them outside the United States. Um, so I think that's an issue that people ought to be thinking about. Well, I think we will let that be the final word. Thank you all for being here, and please join me in thanking the panel.